All right. Well, why don't we get started? I know um, we have, you probably all have busy days as well, and people might join us as we go. And Karen, I don't know. Oh, good. You hit recording. That's great. All right. Well, welcome, everyone, and good morning. I hope you're all having a good week, midweek, and it's good to see your faces. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit. Karen, I don't know if you have a copy of the agenda. I don't have it up right now. Yep. Um, I'll put it in the chat. Okay. Appreciate it. We're starting with Britco OISP check-in invitation and the scripts. Gotcha. Okay. So I wanted to first um, tell you about a couple of um, feedback sessions that we're hosting over the next month. And you may have seen this in the provider newsletter, but I wanted to remind you that we had promised at the beginning when we had launched our um, new OISP and Britco that we would be periodically checking in with you um, to get some feedback. And so we're six months in, which is hard to believe. And um, we have a fo uh, um, Britco OISP focus group, and that's on the 15th of this month between 11 and 1230. Um, we do have, we're going to be talking about what's working, what's not working, um, getting your advice and feedback as we move forward. I will say that we met with uh, Dodd yesterday, and they're very eager to hear our feedback too. So just know that we're hearing it. We want to do stuff locally, and we also want to um, make sure that at the state level, they're also understanding our experience in a large county with this transition. But we'll also be serving a light lunch, so um, come hungry, and we'll look forward to seeing you there. Um, the second thing I want to mention is we have been working with Miami University, and there is a researcher there that also happens to be a parent of a child with a disability, and she lives in Hamilton County, and she is very invested in supporting providers and figuring out are there Anything, any unturned stones in terms of what we can do to um, support our DSPs. So as a result, she's doing a study. Um, strikingly, there aren't many out there for our particular field. So she's really customizing this for our field. The, the end goal is to understand what incentives and what um, um, unique things we can do for DSPs as incentives to keep them and retain them. So, so that's really the end goal. But in order to do that, she needs to get great feedback from, from providers. And so, um, you know, we have been, um, had robust provider participation in our county for many years. So this is a really great place for them to be getting feedback. So you may have seen a couple of invitations um, in the provider newsletter. And I just wanted to remind you that we've got, um, after that OISP Britco focus group, uh, the researchers are going to come and um, and get some feedback about um, what you found that's worked. Um, Jen, uh, Karen just put the contact information um, of the researcher in the um, chat. So um, if you're able to join us for both of those, that's great. If you're able to join us for one or the other, that would be awesome. But to stay, that's from 1230 to 130. It's a, an hour long, really um, directed focus group with questions about what's working, um, what do you think may work as incentives and kind of getting a feel for that. Um, we also are hosting, um, a set, and if you're a part of the gold standard group, there's a separate session. So we're really hosting two sessions for um, provider leaders to find out about um, your, get your good advice about that. And then secondly, we're hosting a DSP focus group. Um, we put that um, ask out to a couple of providers, and I just wanted to say that broadly. Um, that is, uh, I will be sending the details following this meeting, or maybe Karen, you can put that in the chat on the date of that. If you are interested, um, or if you have DSPs who might be interested, because it's a study, we can't um, have you personally invite them. Um, we can have them, you can give your DSPs information and they can go directly to this um, researcher to say that they're willing to have a one hour Zoom meeting um, to give their feedback on what would be meaningful for them. So hope that all makes sense. We'll put it, um, we'll put that information in the chat. And if you have any questions about anything regarding those two, call me or um, email me directly. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. Any questions around those two kind of feedback sessions? Okay. All right. So I'm going to turn this over to um, Jen, I think you're talking about waiver updates, right? I honestly didn't look what order the agenda went, but sure. If you're ready for me, I'm ready. All right, good morning, everyone. So there are some pending waiver changes that I ordinarily would not even bring up this uh, early. They're just now out for public comment and they would not be effective until November. 
We are anticipating likely some changes, um, but we're getting a lot of questions. So I just want to put it on your radar that these things are out there. Um, it is very early in the rulemaking process, but we do anticipate most of these things will occur. Um, there could be some tweaks along the way. Um, some things we're hoping get changed. There's some things that we're not necessarily um, very happy with as written, but I think some good things overall are coming. Um, so just to give you an overall idea of what's going on, um, with Appendix K, we've been working under that. So if you remember back, it feels like um, forever ago now in some ways, but back in 2020, when the pandemic hit and we all were working together, scrambling around, trying to figure out how to adapt, uh, the department um, under some federal provisions put in place um, what we know as Appendix K, which made some allowances, some flexibilities under our waivers um, for some things that we previously could not do. Now, many of those things have already been put into permanent rules. So for example, we've talked a lot about our uh, changes in our level one waiver budgeting. That was one of the things that was temporary that got put into rule as a long-term um, provision. But there are things sitting out there that have not yet been put in rule that will expire November 11th. That is when the wind down period goes away. So with Appendix K, it ended at the end of the um, public health emergency, but then there's a six month wind down. So essentially the things that we have in place are allowed to continue, but we're supposed to be planning for them to go away, which is what they have called the wind down. So what's out there in rule right now is the department's effort at um, getting things in place for the end of the wind down period. So maybe more info than you wanted, um, but um, I will have a PowerPoint. We will be doing training uh, on this. Um, I, I'm not gonna share the PowerPoint today, I don't think, although I don't know, Karen, do you want me to share it or not? It's very broad. I think we can wait till maybe we have more final details if you're if the group's okay with that. If anyone's really dying to hear it, feel free to raise your hand. I'll go over the stuff. I just I, I'm a little leery about sharing the PowerPoint at this point. Um, we're going to talk to our, our staff on Thursday about this. We haven't even gone over this with our internal staff. Again, I normally wouldn't share this early, but it's out there. There's a lot of um, parent groups and some provider organizations talking about it. So I just wanted to put it on your radar in case you're not in one of those groups. So broadly, a couple of the things um, that they're looking at. The first thing that they're looking at is a change, and this is actually an ODM rule, the Ohio Department of Medicaid. So it's not in our chapter, it's actually a Ohio Department of Medicaid rule uh, as proposed, and it would affect more than just our waiver system. So it'll be all waivers, it would affect Medicaid state plan services and private duty nursing. And the change would be um, similar to what's in place currently under Appendix K in that parents and they have defined it broader. I'm gonna say parents as we talk about this just because it's lost words, but it's the um, any legally responsible family member that's an adult for a minor child. So I'm gonna, in general, that's parents. It could be um, parents, step-parent. There's a very broad definition. Could be any family member that's legally responsible for a minor, okay? Foster parents, step-parents, uh, it goes as far as other family members. What would be, put in place as proposed is that those people would continue to be permitted to be paid as direct support professionals. So they could be the DSP for the minor child if certain criteria are met. The criteria is still being worked out, but there's an extraordinary care assessment that's proposed that's coming with it. So for example, you'd have to prove that the care, if I'm the parent, I have to prove that the care that my child needs exceeds that of what a typical child of the same age would need, okay? That's one of the criteria. There's also some hardship criteria where they'd have to prove that they can't find another provider. They first have to try for a other willing and able provider. Uh, they also um, have to prove that it's affecting their job status. So if, if there's not an effect on them and they can't find a provider, then it's a no-go. So there's a number of other criteria. There are limits on hours. Um, there's some extra um, requirements for providers. So if you are a provider agency, and you're, you currently may have a few parents you're, you are paying to be the direct care staff because that's per, currently permitted, but there would be additional oversight requirements. For example, the parent cannot be responsible for any other minor children at the time they're providing service. So I think from a provider perspective, since we're here with providers, I would just say, I think that's gonna be a challenge for you to monitor and police, if you will. You know, So if Karen is wanting to be the provider for her son, and she has three other kids in the house and she's the only caregiver, she can't do it at that time. She has to be the only, the only person she could be writing care for at the time is the one she's being paid to provide care for. So that one I would say is probably the most um, controversial. I think there's um, some concern just 
globally, uh, both in our county and around the state about the potential impact. And I think there's some very good things. I think there's some situations where it's extremely appropriate and be really good. It's just my opinion. Um, but I think there are some concerns about the broadness and about our ability to manage and for providers, their ability to manage and keep track of this. So I think we'll hear more more to come on that. I do think it will come. I'm not sure exactly how it'll look, but if you hadn't heard about it, I want to make sure to mention it today so you can keep your eye on it. I don't know if I, I'll ask, I'll ask for questions. I don't know if I'll be able to answer them, but I can try. Any questions about this particular thing before we move on to the next one? Okay. All right. The next thing that this is was, oh. excuse, <clears throat> Hi, <Jim. clears throat> excuse me, this was, this was covering just if the parent was overseeing a minor child or a minor in essence, right? Correct. Not if you had a young adult. Correct. Okay. You got it. That would still be permitted if you're talking about an adult child all the same allowances that are in place now would still be there, nothing different coming for that. I understand. Thank you. Unless you're doing shared living, which I'll get to here shortly, there could be, there are some potential changes to shared living coming that might affect some people, depending on what your situation is. But let me go in order so I don't forget things, um, but I may have more that you might be interested in hearing, Jim, about um, care for adult children. Okay, so the second thing that's coming and this is going to be a provision in both the HPC rules and in the shared living rules. And it is a provision that would allow, with county board approval, a provider of home or personal care or shared living to provide needed care to an individual who's hospitalized. This has long been a problem. Um, it's not something prior to um, the CARES Act, we weren't able, there was nothing we could do, even if we thought it was really needed and really good for the person, we couldn't authorize it. During the CARES Act, we have been able to, on a very limited basis, allow this. But I will tell you, the, the, uh, the arrangement they have in place currently under the CARES Act is extremely confusing. Um, it's not very good, in my opinion, the way it works. We, we have not advertised it. So if you're saying, I've never heard about this, it's because we have not advertised it. Because you can't do it until after the fact. And so it puts us and the provider in a really bad situation, in my opinion. So, you know, if Jim came to me and his agency wanted to provide care to someone in the hospital and they're going in and he's doing the right thing and asking up front, could you guys authorize this? We can't. It's not allowed to be authorized until after the fact. And there's it's very vague as to what we're allowed to authorize. So we've done a few when we knew about it. Um, it it's not been um, a, a really clean process. So this rule would take the place of that and would put it in into those rules. So into the HPC rules and into the shared living rule. And with county board approval, with some limits, we would be able to approve it for providers to do so. So there are some limits. I think there, I think this one's a good one. I think there are many times when we would like to approve this. We think someone really needs it. You know, many of our folks don't do well in hospital settings without some familiarity around them, their staff, others. Um, so we could do it in the way it's written. I think it, it has to be awake staff. So you couldn't do on behalf of or um, on site on call it has to be awake. Uh, and there's a limit on the hours per day. So. I think it's very reasonable, and I don't know if we'll see changes to it or not, but that's out there pending, and we'll keep you posted. Jennifer, uh, yes, could you no. give us could you give us an example of an authorized service while that adult child is hospitalized? Sure. So um, a pretty easy one I can think of uh, that we've had happen. Uh, we've had people who go to the hospital, and you know that can be very traumatic for anyone and for our individuals, especially sometimes. So we've had people that will um, continually try to pull out their IVs if there's not someone there that they know that can kind of help calm them, de-escalate them, you know, keep them from doing those kinds of things. Um, and if there wasn't a staff person able to be there or a loved one, a family member, someone, they might restrain that person, right? Restrain them to the bed, something we don't like to see. But the hospital obviously can't provide a one-on-one -on -one staff. That's just not um, feasible. So that's a kind of a situation where we would be able to do it. Um, because we have a very objective, clear reason why that person needs to be there. So that, does that help? It does. It tells me that there needs to be a, uh, and that's why you're saying that it really authorization is given after the fact uh, in this situation as well, that a condition has to exist. That well, is Currently, it has to happen after the fact. Uh, the way I'm reading this proposed rule, this would be like anything else if, you know, 
your son or daughter was going in and the provider was willing to do it, you would contact us at that time and we would say, yes, this makes a lot of sense. Here's what we can authorize. So I think that's where it'll improve. This will allow us to do it in real time, which makes a whole lot more sense. And I don't want to say it's a condition. I think it, it's really very person centered. So it's really about that person, their needs and whether or not it's really necessary. Um, they talk in the rule about um, it being necessary for the safe transition both into and out of the hospital. So that makes a lot of sense, right? Because it makes it's really important for someone there to understand the discharge plans and all that follow up that's needed, things like that. So I think it's a little broader. That was just one example that I gave you. Okay. I think it'll be a good thing. Okay. Um, the next topic I want to just touch on is uh, there's going to be, a, as proposed, uh, there's a provision in there for to allow shared living and residential respite to be provided on the same day. So currently, there is a provision that went in place during the pandemic that allows a person who's receiving shared living, if the caregiver is absent for some reason or can't provide that care, the shared living provider, we're able to authorize a little bit of HPC to cover. So for example, during the pandemic, the reason this was put in place is if Angie is the shared living provider for Brandy, and now Brandy typically goes to a day program during the day or work, and Angie goes to work, not a problem, right? It's not, there's no care needed during that time because she's at Brandy's at day program or work. During the pandemic, many of our folks were home and it didn't necessarily mean that their provider was gonna be home or be available. And so <clears throat> they put it in place for that kind of reason. It's been pretty popular. Um, from a county board perspective, it's not been great because the rules were not very clear, so it was really hard for us. Um, and CMS will not allow the department to put that in a rule permanently because shared living and homemaker personal care, HPC, have too similar of a definition. And so what they're going to be doing is allowing um, a new 15-minute residential respite to be put in place that we could use if that scenario existed. So, for example, if uh, there was a couple of hours during a week when caregiver Angie was not available to provide care to, to Brandy, who's in shared living, but she couldn't be left alone. We could authorize, say, four hours of residential respite that uh, the provider, a different provider, would bill at a 15-minute unit. So that, I think, is going to be a good thing. Um, there's some details in there I won't cover today because I think they could change in terms of limits. Um, there are some limits in there currently. I'm not sure they're going to remain the same, so I'm not going to throw them out there. Um, but I think that'll be a good thing overall. We'll, we'll look for the details and do a lot of training as we get much closer. Thanks, Jen. Any final questions on that? And I have two more that are very minor and then I'll, I'll, I'll be done. Um, currently, there are proposed exemptions to shared living that would allow the county board to continue authorizing a person's services as homemaker personal care rather than shared living, even when the person lives with the provider. Um, that one has a lot of um, noise, I'll just say, going on around it. So I'm not even going to go over the currently proposed exemptions because I do feel it could be changing. So just know that that's something that's proposed could be changing, though. Um, there's a question from Dorinda. How does it? Oh, it just popped down. I think, Dorinda, you asked, how does it affect the shared living billing? Back to the other thing I talked about, I assume. Um, so the way it's going to work. Um, is the shared living provider would continue to bill. So they would bill their daily rate. Um, so long as they provided some portion of the care, that's one of the things that's being debated. How much of the care do you need to provide in that given day to still bill your daily rate? So I, I, they will. the idea is they would still bill because of providing a, a portion of the care, um, but then the rest of it would be billed for that portion of the day when the caregiver didn't provide care, the shared living provider. No problem, Dorinda. That was a good question. So the exemption to shared living, I'm not going to go into detail because that is being debated currently, but just know that that is likely to come. I do believe it will come. It's just a matter of exactly how it looks. Um, so I think that could be good. I think we know there's folks out there who don't fit well in the shared living model. And so I think this is appropriate, my personal opinion. Um, not that it matters, it's coming anyway, but um, I, I think the details are going to change a little. So we'll, we'll talk more when we, when we know more, when it's closer. And the very last thing I have is that there's a cleanup on a rule um, that we've been sort of looking at in that parents of parents of legally responsible family members currently of minors currently can be the DSP under Appendix K and the CARES Act, but they cannot be the DOO of the agency. And that rule was always meant to say they also cannot own the agency, but it didn't specifically spell that out. So that is a cleanup of a rule that's coming at the same time it's proposed to go into effect in November as well. So 
that is what I have. Karen, maybe more than you wanted. I tried to be brief, but there's a lot, there's a lot of hot things going on. If you want to read the rules, the department's rules are out there on their website under rules under development. I want to say when you go into that page, it's the far right one. I can look for the link and pop it in the chat here in a minute after I finish. We'll keep you posted and we'll do a lot more training as the time rolls closer to the fall. Thank you. Don, Don did you have a question? Yeah, I do. What does DDO stand for? DOO is Director of Operations. Um, DOO. Okay, mm -hmm. sorry about that. Thank you. And um, it's a term that um, the Department of Developmental Disability uses instead of CEO. They switched maybe two years ago. All right. It would, I'm, it would affect the CEO too if you called it that, correct? It's regardless of title, whoever's functioning in that capacity of your agency, correct, Karen? Thanks, Brandy. Brandy put in the chat um, the rules under development link. So if you want to take a link, a look at that. Um, I am going to cover a few things. And um, first of all, I'm going to share our provider page um, that's available on the internet. You guys should be seeing that. Does that look correct? We had a few people that asked to be added to the newsletter link. And it makes me think that you guys might have others at your agency that you would like to include on our newsletter. And so um, if you, scroll down you can just click on this link and just sign up for the provider newsletter for don chris and Britt, i already added you on today so you should be getting anything that comes out um and then i want to share a few other helpful resources that might help you on our provider page um, on the communications we always post our provider forums under this link so you can review um old forums and our old provider newsletters in this compliance tab we have um, documentation and also um, some of these have been updated. So the three that say OISP here are new documentation sheets. They're optional to use. We know a lot of you guys use electronic documentation, but it's a good reminder um, to quickly see what the requirements are for documentation. So we have um, outcome and experience documentation, service and support documentation, and then this middle one is those combined. So if you just wanted them in one document that is there for you. And those are in Word and Excel. So if you do need to edit how many experiences someone has, feel free to add those in um, and customize them any way that you need. Um, we wanted to mention too, with the OASP coming out, we wanted to be clear um, that DODD is continuing to look for outcome and experience documentation, but they are also looking for that service and support documentation. Um, and then with the OASP, there's the knowledge and risk. There are all three sections towards the end of the OASP. Um, the known and like, sorry, known and likely risks. The known and likely risks section may include um, documentation requirements for level of supervision or um, specifics related to that person's needs. Any questions? Would it help you if I opened these up so you looked at the, you were able to look at them quickly? I'll assume not. They were also included on the provider newsletter that was sent out yesterday with the agenda um, direct links to those new forms as well. Um, scrolling down a little bit farther for the residency agreement, Tom, um, the license residency agreement and the residency agreement was updated. The rule changed last year um, just to remove some small bits about um, the provider's ability to end a lease. So we've updated those to reflect those changes. So the next time, if you have somebody that's using a residency agreement for a provider controlled setting, you can get those updated. All right, and then there's just other folders with resources as well. All right, so the other thing I want to talk about is our provider search tool. We are wanting, Jim, did you have a question? I saw you on mute. Yeah, um, golly, did it just uh, escape me. Um, regarding documentation for agreements, um, if you're a shared living provider providing for uh, your adult children, you are not required to have that residency agreement in formalized. Is that correct? The rule technically does not give that allowance, but we've received separate guidance from DOO that they will not be looking for a residency agreement for shared living settings right. where the family is the provider. Great question. 
So there is there is no current requirement or is there rules under discussion that might lead us to have one, is that correct? And it is currently in rule. If you just look at rule, it is actually required that you have one, but they are saying that they are not citing family members. I see, all right, thank you, Karen. You're welcome. Um, thanks, Jim. The other thing I wanted to mention too is if there's any resources that you feel are missing that could be helpful to the provider community, we're always help willing to develop resources or add them. So um, just reach out. Provider support is always a good place to start to let us know. So I want to talk about our provider search that's available on the internet to internal and external users. And really it's a guide to help individuals um, really guide the process of locating a provider. So part of what our commitment to individuals and our um, as an agency is to validate provider data, to make sure that when individuals, family members, SSAs are trying to reach a provider that we have the correct contact information. Um, so we are asking providers to go in and validate their data in the provider search. So um, it's pretty easy to use, it's pretty intuitive. You just go in and um, I'm gonna enter creative connections because I asked for permission ahead of time and they gave me permission to use their name. And then you just click on search and it brings up your provider data. So this is sort of a quick look on the view. Um, so just look through for your provider agency or independent provider to make sure that this is accurate. The primary emails, so if a provider requests if a SSA or individual requests a referral and sends out an email through the system, um, they are using this primary email. Moving forward, if you click on the name, it lists um, provider, other provider contacts, provider details. So we are asking you to go through this information and make sure that it's accurate. And then the final step in the validation is to complete let me pull up um, a survey monkey saying I validated my data or I need change to data. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. You should be seeing the email provider newsletter that was sent out. Does that look correct? So in here is a link. The first link is a link to the provider search. The second link is steps to validate. So I know I went through it a little bit quickly today. Um, I've created a document that walks you through this and provides screenshots. Um, so it's just a few quick steps. And then the final thing is that we're asking you to complete the survey monkey. So it's on the survey and it's also on that email that I sent. You click on the survey monkey, you enter your company name, you enter that email address. And then if your profile is correct as it is, you just click um, no, I don't need to make updates to my profile. But if you do need to make changes, click on yes, and then it will walk you through what changes you need to make. Should be pretty quick and it shouldn't take too much time, hopefully. Uh, if we don't receive those back from your agency, we'll have to reach back and try to contact you. Otherwise you won't mark us validated on our provider search. Karen, I have a quick question. Um, I think sure. if I remember correctly, there is a MUI um, tab. So we are trying to, to email all of the um, uh, investigation summaries, reminders for annual analysis, all that kind of stuff. So there should be um, an MUI contact or no? Is that is that on the provider search part? There is one. There is also, um, there is one in provider search and there's also one in brick code that we maintain. Yep. All right, any questions with that? Thank you so much. And we're asking independent providers as well as agency providers to go ahead and validate their data. Um, one caveat is if you aren't, request, aren't accepting additional referrals, you won't show up on the provider search to that on the external site. Um, or if for some reason your agency is suspended, um, it won't show up as well because you're not able to accept referrals. So just a few little caveats, just in case you are not finding yourself. And that's all I have. So Jenny, you can feel free to take over and I will add those last two to the newsletter list as well. Okay. Um, I really don't have, I, I, I asked for a placeholder just in case something came up, but um, I do a couple of just quick updates. I wanted to share that um, if you, sorry, I'm having 
memory issues on my computer. I'm having memory issues with myself, but memory issues on my computer. So it keeps turning off my camera. Um, so uh, just real quick, if you didn't see in the um, memo Monday, they are going to offer um, an OITMS uh, training for reports, um, those types of things. I will be there. Um, I know they're offering it for providers. It says county boards, all those kinds of things. So if you're interested, that was in the last memo Monday. Um, OITMS, I, I, I'm assuming this is as good as it gets, which is kind of discouraging, but um, I guess we're going to have to learn to, to live with it and work with it. So having said that, um, we are going to do the 2022 annual analysis in July, which is going to be interesting because we're six months into the new year. Um, so um, I, I don't have a date yet, just know it'll be in July and I'll um, send out an invite if, if anybody would like to attend. Um, probably, I think I'm gonna do like a hybrid. So if anybody wants to come see real life people, um, we'll, we'll do that. Um, otherwise you can join by a Zoom. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that bear with us if you are getting um, investigation summaries that you're like, oh my gosh, this is like, you know, from six months ago, just know that um, we had some issues, obviously working through the OITMS and some cases that we thought were entered and saved were not entered and saved. So the letters didn't go out and it's just a big kind of debacle as we catch up. Just know that, um, the investigation is complete and um, the disposition is, is available. So if you have any questions um, about, uh, you know, where the status is of your report or you didn't receive a report or whatever the case may be, feel free to reach out to either me or the investigator assigned. Um, again, some of these things have kind of gotten, gotten lost um, in, in transit. So I think that was all I had. I think I saw a question come up. Jenny. Yes. Um, forgive my newbie questions, but I am yeah. a newbie. Uh, the the OITMS. What does that stand for? Is that an investigational? Uh, oh, oh, OITMS. So it's Ohio Information. Oh boy, Ohio Incident Tracking and Monitoring System. There we go. I so see. it's okay. it's where we essentially it's the database where all of the MUIs are collected and stored at at DODD. I understand. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like there's our county boards required to send MUI summaries to agency providers five days after the case is recommended for closure. Um, yes, general rule of thumb. Yes, that is five days after it's recommended. Yes. Um, all right, I don't know if there's any other questions. Um, if, the, if the summary was never sent, you can reach out to um, myself or the investigator that was assigned. There are some um, exceptions, obviously, to that rule. Um, so we can talk through that if it's a specific uh, case by case. So. And I provided the link to sign up for Memo Monday and other subscriptions from DODD. Um, so hopefully that helps. Did anybody join our PPE pickup last week? I hope, um, or I think it was last week, maybe two weeks ago now. I hope you guys enjoyed the extra goodies from Jenny. Um, I know Walk of Joy reached out. There were some interesting goodies in there this time. So we had some anti-aging cream, <laughs> some batteries. <laughs> Some sun, uh, some uh, glow, I don't know, tanning cream. There were some interesting things donated this time. So Whenever Jenny gets donated, it goes right out the door, right, Jenny? That's right. I, <laughs> I, I don't know I, what you're going to get. No donation goes um, on, 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 you know, I take it all. So we enjoyed it. Thank you. Lisa, do you mind putting your um, email in chat or phone number so Jenny can follow up with you directly? Sounds like there's some outliers that's happening in that situation. Yeah, we, I can follow up after. Thank you. 
All right, anything else? Don, do you have anything else? I don't. Unless people have announcements or things that we all need to know before we close. Just uh, if I might, and I don't know, this is a, a question in cyberspace or not, but uh, <laughs> as an independent provider, I'm I'm looking forward to my first compliance review. No one and ever I says noticed... that, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I think and, uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the eternal optimist. And uh, I noticed that, uh, and I went right through to the very end of December of 2023, the site does not accept any um, requests for dates in assignment, et cetera. And I put a blurb out to uh, um, Katie Williams, I believe it was, on Region 4. And I got a nice response from Hannah uh, that works out of that office, but they are saying that we may now have to uh, apply within another county. Is that what is being experienced, that we are so jammed for Hamilton County that we are going to be deferring to another county to book in that county as opposed to ours? Uh, I'm just throwing this out. Does yeah. anyone have any knowledge about how one goes about? So, it's, so arranging. I think what is happening is for independent providers, DODD is very far behind with reviews. And so they've asked for office space from us for um, to do sort of bulk independent provider reviews for September and October. And we've given them six dates to do that. And so Jim, it sounds like all those dates are taken. Is that what you're saying for Hamilton County? And they're asking you to travel to another county for one of the days that they have open? That's what is being alluded to. And uh, I'm, I'm, I've been, and, and it was very helpful. I mean, they, they have thrown out to me, Hannah has left a, uh, uh, on my, our answering machine uh, that uh, I should be vigilant in looking for openings for compliance review, not only in Hamilton County, but in some adjacent counties where there may be some opening time slots made available. And I guess my big question is, is how does one determine that? Uh, we have a lot of surrounding counties. Uh, do I look at every one of them and go through, you know, from, from one to 30 or 31? Uh, how does one go about appropriately making sure your name is in the hopper to see that you're pursuing the obligation of registering for a compliance review? Yeah, that's that a great question. Sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, we believe there might be more dates opening up in September and October for Hamilton County. Are, have they posted the September dates for Hamilton County? That's what I have heard. However, I've gone in daily and clicked on every day uh, for both September and October, and nothing is available to date on the site. Okay. Can you put your email in chat and we can sort of follow up with you on our end, Jen? Sure, absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. I have uh, had an issue. I'm sorry, this is Jasmine Berno. Hi, Jasmine. Good morning, everyone. Um, I've had an issue with uh, mine as well. So I believe that I scheduled, I had a response uh, that confirmed it. And then maybe a day later, I had a cancellation of, of that invitation by the system. Um, I did reach out, um, I can't remember to whom at the time to ask about it and they were supposed to be getting back to me. Um, so, I'm not sure if that was for Hamilton County um, because I have since received a compliance review invitation from DODD. So I am a little bit confused as well. I'm also um, not um, sure about if I am traveling to them or if they are coming to me. Um, so yeah, any, yeah. any guidance around this would be extremely helpful. Thank you. Jasmine, if you put your email in the chat too, we can try to follow up and see where things landed. Okay, thanks. There's a question from Tracy also, Karen, that you might get her email on the chat. I don't know if you saw it. 
So if you need to have a review completed as an independent provider, DODD would have reached out to you directly with a letter saying um, you have a review coming up and this is the new format that they're gonna do to get caught up. For agency providers, um, this doesn't apply at this point. They'll reach out directly to schedule a review via email. I have I have a question. Uh, yeah. This is Celine, this is Celine um, with Affinity Healthcare Solutions. Can you please? I know you were saying something about the OTSI training. Um, can you expand on it? And then, uh, how do you get registered? Jenny, do you have the link? Um, no, I didn't get the link on uh, the OTMI. How? What is that? Oh. Uh, yeah, so that's the state system. Um, and if you're not signed up, um, honestly, I don't know how you go about getting like a new, um, I think we were, people who were already established and were having issues were reaching out to Connie McLaughlin. Um, I can see if you go to DODD's page, I believe that under OITMS, it's gonna give you where you have to do like a, uh, kind of sign up for it. I can I can try to get some more information and, and pass that on to you. So I was multitasking. So and um, who was the Celine? This is okay. Celine. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Renee, can you unmute yourself and um, maybe and let us know what you're looking for with Britco? Oh, Renee doesn't have a mic, sorry. Um, so I can show you where to find um, our resources on Britco that we developed. Let me get the right screen sharing. So you should be back at our provider page, hamiltondds.org backslash providers. And then if you click on training, it will open a folder that says OISP Britco. And that talks about how to get access, how to add users, um, how to receive notifications and other trainings that we've had in examples. Does that cover what you're looking for? And Don, we have a request for a little bit more information on Northstar. I'm um, sure. Yeah, I mean, we are mid um, uh, sessions. We have it's a cohort program, and um, it's for uh, agencies that really want to do a deeper dive um, in terms of developing. Um, this year, it's for folks that are, it's for providers that are at that point where they're growing. So they're sort of going from small to medium sized providers. And um, we just have a walk through a curriculum. So we have six sessions over the course of six months. We um, have provider and um, HCDDS mentors. So there's a mentor component. And um, we will have, if you want to have more information, you can definitely reach out to Jamie um, Steele or myself and we can talk to you about next year's or even the program that we might start in the fall. But I mean, it really is a um, uh, provider development program and you do it in tandem with support from us and from, uh, from your fellow providers. I don't know, Jamie, you wanna add anything to that? Uh, no, I mean, I think you did a good job. Mm -hmm. it's, if you're interested in, um, in, in just being, you know, a more responsive agency uh, to as you're growing, uh, learn getting resources to help you grow, that kind of thing. I think North Star is a good option for you. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Um, Tracy, your agency is North Star, but I think it's always good for people to hear what we have going on. There you All go. right. Um, Mark, you messaged me privately to talk about the med and men rule. So feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, just, just a, a couple points. Um, I've actually been working with the Ohio Healthcare Association, um, had contact with uh, 
uh, MUI department in uh, Columbus was Scott Phillips and uh, uh, Dustin, uh, one of the, actually he's out of the uh, Northeast region. And I mentioned uh, something to Jamie Steele a while back as well. Um, the med, admi med administration rule is coming up for the five-year review. And there's just one item that I'm concerned about or want to really address, and that is the definition of a med error. Um, what we're looking at right now, uh, and I'm trying to push, um, recently we regrettably had med errors, but they were classified as med errors. And I've asked for clarification from the department, and they said yes, by definition, under the administration rule, a client that refuses medication is considered a med error. Openly, I'm challenging that and would like to change the definition because I believe the correct category under the MUI rule, administration rule, would be a medication concern. It sends a whole different connotation as it relates to the DSP. And when they do everything under their power to say, hey, you need this med at 8 a.m., nope, not taking it today. Everybody on this call could say if there are times where they just don't feel like they want to take a medication or don't want to take something, they have the right to as an individual. If somebody's informed consent, say, I understand it's good for me, but today, not today, not taking it. It's, it's, it's marked as a refusal, but then it's charted as a med error. So when we do statistics, we see a higher level of med errors, which I don't believe should fall in a med error category. If you put it as a med concern, which is a category that could be tracked, it sends a whole different connotation. And it, it, it's really more appropriate because now we're saying it is a concern. So what are we gonna do about that concern? We're gonna address it with the physician. We're gonna do counseling. We're gonna do some other follow-up with that individual. And if there's a pattern or a trend on these med concerns of refusals, then we go a higher level and say, hey, we have to look at a different way because um, the potential health issues related to this, maybe blood pressure, heart-related issues. So as of right now, it comes in as a med air. And my goal is to have that revised or changed. So I'm just giving that open comment to providers. And if anybody feels like, hey, uh, we agree, we think that's sort of appropriate, because I think it's a slap in the face to the hardworking DSPs. They've done everything they can, and yet they feel like they own a med air, which they shouldn't. That's my two cents. Thanks for bringing that to our attention, Mark. And we have Hi. our three nurses on the, the call as well. So they'll keep that on their radar and advocate on behalf of our provider community as well for additional maybe categories. Yeah, and I think, Mark, you probably have already done this, but you know, a potential workaround would be to get that into a person's plan so that they are tracked. Um, if it's somebody who is, is frequently going to refuse, yes, it's, it's an issue and we wanna make sure that we, we track that, um, but it may not have to be on a formal um, incident report every single time. So that's just maybe thinking about some workarounds. Jenny, that's a good kind of a temporary fix for us just to try to say, hey, this is what our goal is and this is why we're doing it. Put it in the plan and then hopefully we can um, get outside the naughty list of the medication error uh, categories. And honestly, I know that how it feels, um, but if somebody's refusing their medications and staff are doing their due diligence, it's really you're not on the naughty list. So <laughs> I know it feels that way, but. It always feels that way. All right. Well, great, great questions, and um, thanks for sharing. Uh, any anything else that needs to that we would like to share or talk about before we um, close today? Somebody asked about filing a complaint with DODD, and so I um, included the online form for that. Oh, good, thank you. All right. Well, good discussion. Thanks for all the questions, the good questions, and then whenever you ask them, it raises our collective understanding. So thanks so much. I hope everybody has a wonderful day, and we'll look forward to reconvening in a month, two months, right? All right. And reach Thank out you. if you need anything in the meantime. Take care, everybody.